Well, hello. How's everybody doing? Ready to worship God? Amen. Amen. Yeah, let's stand. Please stand. We're going to pray. Father God, thank you again for being this year, Lord. Thank you for your mercies. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your peace, Father. Thank you for all that you do in our lives, Lord. You can see, I mean, one, one of the things that we see out here is, is your creation, Father, and you put so much detail into it. We thank you for that. We thank you that you love us so much. So we want to come to your house and learn more about you, Father, and your will. And we just pray that you bless this worship time, Father. We want to worship you because we love you, and we thank you. And it's in Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Amen.
proclaim, to proclaim your love in the morning and your faithfulness at night, to proclaim.
stand with us on this last one. beautiful afternoon, God. And Lord, you are beautiful. You're wonderful. Father, you're great and awesome, God. You're merciful. You're gracious. You're loving. You're kind. And Father, without you, Lord, we would have, we'd have nothing. 
we'd be lost, hopeless. Father, we thank you for your love and your grace. We thank you for the cross. Father, this evening we pray that your word would sink into our heart. Father, to those deep, secret places that only you can get to, God. The Father, you would remove or we'd give to you, Lord, all those things that displease you. All those things that, Father, don't belong in our heart. And Father, we look to you now that your spirit would minister to us, that he have his way with us, that he'd reveal the scriptures to us, Lord. And Father, we pray for the many needs of your people. We pray for the church, Lord, for those who are sick. We pray for Sister Frances, Lord, that you'd be with her, that you'd help her out, Lord. You'd cover her, that you'd minister to her, Lord. Father, we pray that you would help to put out all of these fires, Lord, that are just is causing havoc, Lord, especially for our firemen, Lord, and that you would protect them, you'd have your hand upon them, Lord, and their families, you'd cover them, Lord. Father, for our policemen, Lord, that you'd cover them, you'd protect them, Lord. The Father, you would just pour out your spirit upon our nation. The Father, we would recognize our sin and that we'd ask for forgiveness, God, and that you would hear our prayer and heal our land, God. Lord, I pray for all of those in the body that are in need, Father, whether they're, they're jobless, Lord, or, or concerned about the next house payment, Lord, or the next bunch of groceries that they need to buy, Father. Lord, we pray for this plague, God, that's covered our land, that, God, you would heal it, that our kids can get back to school, Father, and that people can get back to work, Lord. And, Father, we pray for the church. Lord, your word says that the gates of hell shall not prevail against us, so let us not worry about the church, because we are the church, God. Your spirit cannot be bound. It cannot be contained. And Father, help us to be creative in the way we preach the gospel, as well as being good witnesses to our city, to our neighbors, God. As we wear our masks as we should, as we social distance as we should, God. Regardless of the things that we hear and all the controversy, God, we are called to be good witnesses regardless. Let not our own opinions, God, take over our behavior. But Father, may we seek peace with the city as long as it's not required, as long as we're not required to compromise, Lord. Father, bless our evening in the study of your word. Bring it to life. We thank you now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. How you guys doing? Go ahead and greet somebody in the 2020 fashion. A wave or a look, a wink. <laughs> How are you guys tonight? Awesome. Glad to hear that. And we do pray a little breeze would kick up and kind of cool everybody off. I want to welcome you here tonight as always, and if you're here for the first time, we are blessed to have you. And if you're tuning in for the first time or second or third time, we're, we're blessed to have you and be a part of our the, the Calvary Chapel Cornerstone family. We are looking at, we are in studying the book of Psalms right now, and so if you have your Bibles, please open up to Psalm 133. Psalm 133, and it's entitled, The Blessedness of Living in Unity. The blessedness of living in unity. David was the king of Judah and Benjamin, and he ruled in Hebron for seven and a half years. He inherited a divided kingdom and almost a civil war. But then the Lord gave him a united kingdom. David could be the one who wrote this psalm when he began his reign in Jerusalem. 
The people usually journey to Jerusalem in family groups. So this psalm perfectly fits the situation. And it applies to individual believers and churches today. Because we also have our family quarrels. We need to learn to walk together in love. Keeping, maintaining the spiritual unity of God's people. That's the work of every believer with the help of the Holy Spirit. And we'll see in this small but, man, powerful psalm, three works of the Holy Spirit shown to us in this psalm. The theme of this psalm is the joy of friendly relationships. The author is thought to be David, but we're not sure. Psalm 33 has been called a psalm of brotherhood. And it's definitely a psalm of fellowship. Not only did this pilgrim, this psalm, or the, the writer, come to Jerusalem with his wife and children, but he's with his friends. And they're having a wonderful time of fellowship together. And these pilgrims came from all over the world as it was known at that time. They had been suffering persecution among unbelievers. What a joyful experience it is for them to be with their own people now, worshiping God with them. Most of us have has heard the phrase e pluribus unum. It's used on the great seal of the United States and on several US coins. And it means one out of many. And that used to be the American dream. The United States of America, one nation under God, called the great melting pot. But can we say that's true tonight? I don't think so. Some schools no longer cite the Pledge of Allegiance. Some parents keep their kids from citing the Pledge of Allegiance. And we are definitely not the United States of America. And it doesn't take long to find out that unity isn't so easily easy to achieve these days. And whatever unity we did have, we see it declining, deteriorating. Because selfish, rival, hostile people selfishly want their own way. They want their own way. And it's not all that different in the church sometimes. When we are supposed to be one, united in Christ, one spirit, one father, one Lord. And we preach sermons on unity like this evening. We sing about unity, brotherhood, fellowship. But the church fellowship is getting weaker, too. We're finding all kinds of reasons for not going to church. This psalm is about unity. The unity of those who live together as brothers. Let's begin with verse 1 of Psalm 133. And here's the first work of the Spirit, the new birth. Notice verse 1, behold, how good and how pleasant it is Notice, for brethren, brethren, that's the work of the new spirit, the work of the spirit, the new birth, for brethren to dwell together in unity. As believers, we are told by Paul in Ephesians 4, 3, to endeavor to keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. The word endeavor means to spare no effort. Whatever I need to do without compromising the gospel if somebody wants to argue with me, I don't argue with them. Believers are one in Christ and, they, and need to avoid being in their little cliques. And unfortunately, we have a lot of cliques in our churches today. Many people, somebody said, would rather be big fish in little ponds rather than little fish in big ponds. But it would be so much better for all believers to dwell together in unity. 
we're going to look at some of the obvious points that the psalmist made here about unity. And then in verse 2, we see the second work of the Holy Spirit, the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Unity is a gift from God. Look at verse 2. It is like the precious oil. Unity is like the precious oil upon the head, running down on the beard, the beard of Aaron, running down on the edge of his garments. The first picture the psalmist uses here is anointing with oil. Oil is a symbol of the Holy Spirit. Specifically, it's the anointing of Aaron, the high priest. An anointing was done at God's direction. And it was done God's way. And it was done with his authority. And any blessing it came with was from God. In verses 2 through 3, three times we read the word running down. Now you actually see it twice running down, but the word descend means coming down. So it's the same meaning. Three times running down. It emphasizes that the blessing of Aaron's anointing was from above because it was coming down from God. We're sinners. And one of the first sad signs of sin is that it separates. Sin creates discord, disharmony, and hostility. And it takes God to defeat sin and bring harmony again. All real lasting unity is from God. Now unity is for all. The second picture that the psalmist uses is the dew of Mount Hermon falling on Mount Zion. Now Mount Hermon was the highest mountain in Israel, several hundred miles north of Jerusalem. You could recognize it because of the dew that fell on its tall peaks. Now here that dew is also said to fall on Zion, which isn't very high. So that dew fell on the very highest peaks as well as the lowest peaks. And like the earlier image, dew comes from above. And it shows that unity is from God. But the main point of this picture is that the dew is, is for little Zion, the lowest mountain, as well as the great Mount Hermon, the highest mountain. And it's not about the refreshing quality of the dew, nor its gentle, common influence. That's the important thing about the dew. The reason that the dew is such a good picture of brotherly harmony is because it falls equally on both mountains, the small and the big. When a country or a church or even a family is at peace, it doesn't just benefit the most recognized or most important people in the group, but everybody the same. Everybody's blessed, and especially the small, the unimportant, and the weak. And in the same way, disharmony hurts everybody. The blessing of unity flows from one person to another. The anointing of Aaron was a blessing from God for him. But Aaron was the high priest. That meant that Aaron, in turn, blessed others. And the oil that was running down from Aaron's beard, running down onto the edge of his garments, that also suggests the flow of blessing. There's even the hint that since the oil, notice it was precious oil, it was the best oil blended with myrrh, cinnamon, cane, and cassia. Exodus 30, 22 and 24. The anointing would have been a sweet-smelling it would have been sweet smelling and it would have filled the air wherever Aaron went. And in, exec, ex, uh, in Exodus 30, 33, this spo a special oil is called perfume. Unity is a sample of heaven because in heaven there will not be any disunity. And then the third work of the Holy Spirit in verse 3 is, is the, the refreshing of the Holy Spirit. Look at verse 3. It is like the dew of Hermon descending upon the mountains of Zion. For there the Lord commanded the blessing, life forevermore. 
the last verse here speaks of everlasting life. Now, some things are good for us, but they're not pleasant. Other things are pleasant, but they're not good for us. But the unity that we have as God's people is good and it's pleasant. And as I said, it's a bit of heaven here and now. It's a sample of heaven. And as I said earlier, unity was an American dream once upon a time. Our country used to be a place where different people, different personalities and backgrounds willingly came together, blended together with similar goals to form a common future, to assimilate and continue to make America awesome and great. But that's not anymore the case. Today, it's all about me. It's all about individualism. People no longer work for harmony. Instead, they struggle with, with each other for group advantages and individual rights. Not caring about other people or their rights. And before that time, there was still something of a Christian attitude in this country, and people used to care about and help other people. Now they're beating them up, killing them, all for their, all for their movement, all for their belief, all for their cause. They believe this is the right thing to do. Today, the majority of focus is, uh, of people is on themselves. And they only deal with others for what they can get. When we think just about ourselves, does it really make us happy? If we focus all of our energy on satisfying even our tiniest desires, shouldn't we be satisfied with life? Listen to what Solomon said in Ecclesiastes chapter 2, verses 1 through 11. I'm going to read it from the New Living Translation. Solomon, I said to myself, come now. Let's give pleasure a try. Let's look for the good things in life. But I found this, too, was meaningless. It's silly to be laughing all the time, I said. What good does it do to seek only pleasure? After much thought, I decided to cheer myself with wine. While still seeking wisdom, I clutched at foolishness. In this way, I hope to experience the only happiness that most people find during their brief life in this world. I also tried to find meaning by building huge homes for myself and by planting beautiful vineyards. I made gardens and parks, and I filled them with all kinds of fruit trees. I built reservoirs to collect the water to irrigate my many flourishing groves. I bought slaves, both men and women, and others were born into my household. I also had great herds and flocks, more than any of the kings who lived in Jerusalem before me. I collected great sums of silver and gold, the treasure of many kings and provinces. I hired wonderful singers, both men and women, and had many beautiful concubines. He says, I had everything a man could desire. So I became greater than any of the kings who ruled in Jerusalem before me. And with it all, I remained clear-eyed so that I could evaluate all of these things. Anything I wanted, I took. I did not restrain myself from any joy. I even found great pleasure in hard work and additional reward for all my labors. He said, but as I looked at everything, I had worked so hard to accomplish, it was all so meaningless. It was like chasing the wind. There was nothing really worthwhile anywhere. That was the outlook of one of the wisest men that lived. It was the outlook of a man who had everything a man could desire. Nothing, he said, was really worthwhile. Life today has just about destroyed families and relationships. Again, making us kind of lone wolves in a sense. 
the family being the most, social, most important social system has been reduced to the basics. Friendship has become so superficial. And they're strained and they're broken over the slightest disagreement or difference. Rules, rivalry, rivalry, hostility, and fear have replaced the affections of love, forgiveness, and loyalty that keeps a friendship going. America is becoming one huge anti-social people. Man, our churches should be a stronghold of fellowship, and yet individual has even invaded the church. A lot of us drive to church, we listen to Christian radio, listen to the sermon, say hi to all of our friends, and go home without really experiencing true fellowship. Earlier, Christianity was so focused on corporate spirituality that communion was taken from the same cup. Now, we know we can't do that today. We listen to study after study about spiritual gifts and how the body of Christ is supposed to work together. And yet our services are often made up of people who have their own agenda and purposes. We've already learned that unity, it comes from God. It's a gift from God. We don't create unity. We're responsible for keeping it. But that can only be done, can be kept when men and women, you know, get outside of themselves and submit their own selfishness to a higher and more worthy cause than just it being about me, than just satisfying myself. And the Bible shows us the way. It shows us the way back in the Garden of Eden. God said in Genesis 2.18, it is not good for man to be alone. God wanted man to live with relationships and in harmony. So he created a woman that the man would be able to share God's generosity with and the joys that God gave our first parents. Adam and Eve shared in his generosity, and they shared in the joy that he gave them until they sinned, until it was all about self. Eve said, I saw, I wanted. A lot of people have eye problems, and it's not the ones in their head. It's all about me. It's all about self. In the New Testament, when Jesus established the new people of God, the church, he didn't leave them by themselves, and he didn't leave them to their own plans to try to figure things out by themselves. But he brought them into a new fellowship called the church. The church. The church of Jesus Christ, the Christian church. Jesus prayed for the church. And one thing that he prayed for was for God to give his people humility. I'm sorry, unity. Instead of, you know, blaming in each other and causing mutual disharmony. Disharmony. Jesus prayed for God to give his people unity. Listen to what Jesus said in John 17, 20 through 23. I do not pray for these alone, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they, will all may, that they all may be one, as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be one in us, that the world, notice, that the world may believe that you sent me, and the glory which you gave me I have given them, that they may be one just as we are one. I and them, you in me, that they may be made perfect in one. I and them, again, and you and me, that they may be perfect in one, and that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them as you have loved me. This isn't a man-made unity. It's not a conjured up unity. It's a unity that's based on a mutual relationship in Jesus Christ and his word. 
it's equal to the unity that's in God. When you study the book of Acts and you study the history of the church, we find Jesus' prayer answered in the neighborhood. That is the community that was formed in Jerusalem after he resurrected and went back to heaven. Listen to what Luke had to say about that church. Acts 2.42, he says, and they continued. The word continued means to abide. They continued or they abided steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, which is the word of God, and fellowship in the breaking of bread and in prayers. This church is the New Testament matching part of the fellowship that's pictured here in Psalm 133. And this was a local city church as well in the book of Acts. It was also a big church. 3,000 people were added to it at Pentecost, making it 3,120 members. The 120 were the 120 who were praying in the upper room for Pentecost. It started with 12 apostles. But when the 12 apostles found that, they weren't, that, that there weren't quite enough people to do the work, they asked the church to choose seven deacons in Acts chapter 6. But the church grew even more because all the people, not just the 12 apostles and seven deacons, shared the ministry. A church that big naturally has its problems. Because again, it had all kinds of personalities and sinful people. But it was still a model church in a lot of ways. One of the most amazing things about this church in the book of Acts was its commitment to fellowship, which means unity. Fellowship has to do with holding something in common. Christian fellowship means common participation in God, and this is what had drawn the early Christians together. 1 John 1, 3 and 4, and truly, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. Somebody said, the stronger your vertical fellowship is, the stronger your horizontal fellowship will be. You see, the stronger your relationship with, is with God, the stronger your relationships with the earthly will be. The church in Acts was a great example of this. These believers had strong relationships with God that resulted in strong relationships with each other. And there are four specific things that, mention, that are mentioned in the description of the church in Acts chapter 2, verse 42. And you know what? This is the prescription for a healthy church. First of all, the apostles' teaching, the apostles' doctrine. Real unity or fellowship can only be established around a common set of convictions. A belief is something you hold. A conviction is something that holds you. They had a common set of convictions and beliefs. What, that's what drew these people together, these believers together in their fellowship. It was common love and devotion to the apostles' teaching. Do we love the teaching of the word of God? This is the first thing that Luke mentions, mentions in this passage. He points it out that in these early days of the church, even though as exciting as it was, really think of it, to take part in the experience of Pentecost, which might have caused them to focus on Pentecost, that is on their experiences, the disciples devoted themselves first to the apostles' teaching the teaching of the Word of God, not their experiences. Experiences come and go. I mean, it could have been really tempting for those early believers to look back at Pentecost and say, man, wasn't that an awesome day? Man, wasn't that an awesome time? I'd sure like to see if we could do that again. And then afterwards, always try to focus on the past. Well, you know, this is how we did it then trying to recreate Pentecost or some other exciting experience. They might have remembered the way the Holy Spirit came down and how the Holy Spirit used them to speak so that those in Jerusalem each heard them in his own or her own language. 
They might have wanted so badly to experience something like that again. They might have been praying, oh, please, Lord, do something miraculous again. But we don't find this here. They're not praying for that. They're not rejoicing in their past experiences. Instead, they're rejoicing in the word of God, the apostles' doctrine, their teaching. This is always the first sign of a spirit-filled church. A spirit-filled church always devotes itself to the apostles' teaching. It's a learning church that backs up its experiences with Scripture and tests them by the Word of God. The second thing that we see in Acts 2.42 is the fellowship. Fellowship. Love for the Word of God led these believers to love one another, which meant that they had a real unity as God's people. And it's sadly missing in a lot of churches today. That experience of warm, loving fellowship of Christian with Christian, which the New Testament calls koinonia. And it was an essential part of early Christianity. In closing, the New Testament lays a heavy emphasis on the need for Christians to know each other closely and intimately enough to be able to bear one another's burdens, to confess their faults one to another, to encourage, exhort, and admonish one another, and minister to one another with the word and song and prayer. As we carry out the, the, the various one another ministries, and again, there's at least 150 times that the phrase one another is used in different ways. We have a one another ministry in our life as a Christian. And it's, to, and, and it's with all the saints. It shows that we have a special relationship to one another. Like the apostle said, Paul, when he said in Ephesians 3, 18 and 19, what is the width and length and depth and height to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge? Like I said, there are over 50, I said 150, there are over 50 one another statements and commands in the New Testament. You see, that calls us to a special kind of life together. Here's just four for an example. Mark 9.50, it says, be at peace with each other. John 13.34, love one another. Galatians 5.13, serve one another in love. Ephesians 4.32, forgive each other. Those are just a few. Carry one another's burdens. Pray for one another. You know, it, it just, like I said, at least 50. The most important thing about them individually and as a group was their devotion to the teaching. And because of the teaching, the love for the teaching, they cared for each other. They cared for one another's you know, difficulties and burdens. They even shared their material possessions with each other, and they gave generously to everybody that was in need. You see, they were unified. They were unified. And then the third thing that we see in Acts 2.42 is the worship of God. The worship of God. In this early church, there was the breaking of bread. It says daily and prayer. Breaking of bread stands for the communion service and prayer, even though it's, it's something that we can do individually and at any time. In this passage, it's actually the formal exercise of prayer together as a congregation. These Christians devoted themselves to breaking, the breaking of bread and to prayer. They got together to observe the Lord's Supper, to pray, and to praise God. Now in Acts 42.6, it says they did this in the temple formally. 
That is, together as a body of believers. And then verse 43, it says, in the homes, informally. They had informal and formal worship. Verse 3 tells us there is to be unity on the earth because there will be unity in heaven. There will be no sin, no evil, no pain, no death, no disharmony in heaven because God's people's desire will be to glorify God. And we read that at the end of chapter 42 that the church grew, it multiplied. Chapter 42, verses 42 through 46, that again is the, is the prescription for a successful church. And when I say that, I don't mean because of man's doing, but it, it's for a healthy church, I should have said, a healthy church, spiritually healthy. It multiplied. It was unified. And that's what we need to seek and we need to keep. Our unity today. Even in the midst of this tumultuous time that we're in, this, this season that we're going through, the world needs to see it in us. The church should be a place of stability and oneness in Christ. Not divided. Doesn't mean we have to be robots of one another. But it means we should be united in the things of Christ, in the scriptures. So may we pray for that. That there be no division among us. Among the church of God as a whole. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this beautiful psalm, God. Though small, it has so much to say. Father, we pray for the unity of the church of Jesus Christ. We pray for the unity of each believer. God, help us to look away from ourselves and to our fellow man. Help us esteem others higher than ourselves, to look to one another's needs, to pray for one another, to love one another. to share one another's burdens. Father, give us that desire because it's a work of the Holy Spirit. And help us not to grieve the Holy Spirit that he may work in us and through us and that he may bless the church and empower the church and use the church to shine in a dark place and to get the message out that people might be saved, that they might come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Father, we thank you. We love you. We give you glory and honor. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Next week, Wednesday, we'll be back in Job. We'll be looking at Job chapter 12. And uh, Zophar had spoken his mind to Job and then in chapter 12 now Job's going to answer so far Amen Please join us on this last song Let's Worship the Lord Your love is amazing steady and changing Your love is
girl that makes me sing. 